Good evening. I'm Max Rudin, publisher of Library of America. And on behalf of our chair, Betsy Smith, our president, Cheryl Hurley, and our directors and staff, welcome. In May 1982, the Morgan Library hosted a party to launch a somewhat unlikely new venture, a nonprofit publisher and cultural institution dedicated to publishing authoritative new volumes of great American writers and to keeping the American literary tradition vital in the culture for readers and writers to discover and rediscover. 35 years and over 10 million books later, here we are tonight, thanks in large part to the loyal friends and gifted colleagues in this room. It's a privilege to know you and work with you and a great pleasure to celebrate this milestone with you. There's a lot to celebrate together. This fall marks publication of the 300th volume in the Library of America series, a definitive collection of Philip Roth's nonfiction called Why Write? We're also embarked on our most ambitious new public humanities project, which connects to the theme of tonight's program. Published this spring for the centennial, World War I in America, told by the Americans who lived it, edited with energy and imagination by A. Scott Berg, shows how the war raised questions that have haunted us ever since. What role should America play in the world? Are our claims to moral leadership abroad undercut by racial injustice at home? What does our nation owe those who fight on its behalf? Scott's book is the centerpiece of a Library of America initiative supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities that is bringing veterans, their families, and the general public together in 120 libraries and museums around the country. They are exploring the continuing significance of World War I by discussing and sharing insights into these writings by Americans who experienced it firsthand. Conversations that allow today's veterans to bring their own experiences to bear on the words and through the words of Americans from 100 years ago. It's just one instance of how Library of America has grown in 35 years into a body of essential writing with a gathering power to resonate with and illuminate what's going on with us and around us, to help us make sense of our lives as people and as a people. There are many others. Pick up series volume 98, James Baldwin's collected essays, and remind yourself in our ongoing conversation about racial justice in America of true North. Or the writers in Becoming Americans, the debate about immigration and refugees becomes something different when it meets the life and color and humanity of these unforgettable American voices. We have much work ahead of us in curating and renewing these precious resources, our American contribution to the deepest human expression, in building awareness, in forging connections with readers. Tonight, we mark how far we've come with grateful acknowledgement of the indispensable partnership of all of you here, readers, writers, scholars, publishing partners, subscribers, members, patrons, friends. You've not only helped make the first 35 years possible, you've made them a deeply rewarding and exhilarating journey. This evening is by way of saying thanks, and here's to the next 35. Speaking of indispensable partners, uh, without initial seed funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities, there would be no Library of America. NEH grants have supported many Library of America projects since then, publishing and public programming initiatives that have made it possible for tens of thousands of Americans to experience a transformative connection to our foundational writing. It's just one small part of the crucial work NEH does. Please join me in welcoming 
and thanking the acting chair of NEH, Margaret Plimpton. Thank you, Max, very much, and thank you, all of you. I'm very proud to be here representing everyone at the NEH on this momentous occasion, marking an incredible 35 years of the Library of America, an organization that grew from the kernel of one big idea and galvanized two national funders, NEH and the Ford Foundation, in a tale of intrigue and nonfiction. <laughs> when the initial NEH planning grant was awarded, in the amount of $17,500 in 1978, leading to the seed money from the Ford Foundation and the endowment, we were merely in our teenage years as a federal agency. Now looking back, having reached our 50th anniversary last year, we're happy to be here to help Library of America ring in its 35th. As you all know so well, the World War I anthology invites us to reflect on the stories of the battlefront and the home front from more than 100, from 100 years ago by immersing ourselves in its 127 pieces, some well known to the public already and some previously unpublished. We are transported into the lives and experiences of the diverse American individuals who lived through the war on both sides of the Atlantic. The anthology brings together multifaceted perspectives of American leaders, the news of the time from Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes or W.E.B. Du Bois, for example, and then also allows us to glimpse into the intimate innermost thoughts of nurses like Mary Borden on caring for the wounded, or to follow Edith Wharton's tours of war zones in the Argonne. Scott Berg has encouraged us to listen to the voices of a great range of Americans from that time, thus also speaking to the ongoing issues of U.S. involvement in war today. The World War I and America Initiative follows the success of, successful path of NEH-supported projects such as the Civil War at 150 and Lincoln in American Memory in which public and online engagement with the texts is arguably as critical as the text preservation in print. In the case of the World War I project, it was exciting to see this proposal come in that went the extra mile in terms of creating a compelling selection of writings and then encouraging communities across the nation to partner with veterans organizations for dialogue and discussion. We as a nation stand to benefit from the analysis brought to bear on American history from this anthology, as well as from the conversations it has supported among veterans, their families, and members of so many local communities. And we are pleased that the ambitious plans for the anthology and programming were inspired in part by the Common Good Initiative and specifically the Standing Together Veterans Initiative that was led under the previous NEH chairman, William Adams. In this regard, we must acknowledge the impressive partnerships forged for this project with the National World War I Museum and Memorial and such veterans organizations as Wounded Warriors and Voices from War. We thank Susan Sadenberg and Gilder Lerman Institute of American History for its continued participation in developing and managing the traveling exhibition program and the educational resources. It is also an honor to share in this celebration here at the New York Historical Society, where we have the opportunity to enjoy its new exhibition honoring the centenary of World War I, World War I Through the Trenches, and consider the powerful responses of visual artists to the war. At NEH, we're proud to have been able to support that traveling exhibition as well. We wish to thank Scott Berg and the group of advising scholars for a masterful editing of this anthology and for all of their efforts through programs and web resources to make the history of World War I as accessible and available to public audiences as possible. Finally, we congratulate President Cheryl Hurley and publisher Max Rudin and the entire staff and board of the Library of America for their steadfast and innovative leadership in the humanities, crafting the library's rich catalog over these 35 years. Thank you for all that you do to continue to keep the best of American writing available to the public, for your dedication to library and community partnerships, 
and for fostering public dialogue on contemporary issues through American literature. Thank you very much. Thank you, Margaret. In high school, A. Scott Berg wrote a book report on F. Scott Fitzgerald and found his vocation. America has been his beat ever since. He is the Pulitzer Prize winning author of five best-selling biographies of iconic Americans. Most recently, Woodrow Wilson, who also plays a starring role in World War I in America. And if all that were not enough service to American letters, he gives generously of his scant time and enormous energy to Library of America as a life trustee. Please welcome Scott Berg. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, 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 thanks. Okay, let's get to it. Thank you. I'm, I'm so happy to be here. Um, this is really very exciting for me because it involves a lot of things. First of all, the Library of America. Second of all, a chance to talk about World War I, which is of uh, great interest to me. In no small measure because it's really, I think, the greatest cataclysm in the last thousand years that is all but forgotten. It's, it's really fading away and it should not be. And that was one of the, thing, one of the reasons I wanted to get into this book. Um, but I just want to say a few words about Library of America, which is I remember in the early 80s when the first articles began to appear that there was something coming called the Library of America. And I went to my local bookstore in Los Angeles and placed my order. And I remember in 1982 when the call came from Dutton's Books and the woman said, they're here. <laughs> that was it. She knew, I knew, I went over, they were gorgeous. I became a collector, I became an avid reader of them all. America has long been my beat. So, so these books were made for me. And over the years, they have proved to be incredible, valuable tools for me in writing nonfiction. Uh, not just the nonfiction authors, but when you write nonfiction, of course, you have, to, you have to illuminate the times. And how better to do that than with the fiction of the day? And then uh, through my agent, Lynn Nesbitt, I became associated with the board of this organization and became an even bigger fan, if that was humanly possible. Uh, and then along came this book, and Max Rudin, whom you've now seen and heard from, uh, Max called up and asked if I could recommend anybody who might edit this volume on World War I. Um, I had just um, written a book on, on Woodrow Wilson, and I gave him a list of some fantastic people. Uh, and about a week later, he called and said, that was a great list. Do you have any other people who might <laughs> edit this book. Yes, I hear two or two more. Third call. Anybody else? No, I'm, I'm kind of at the, uh, Max, are you asking me uh, if I might want to edit the book? And the answer was yes, in large measure, because at that point, I didn't want anyone else to do it. Um, I felt a kind of ownership here because of the Library of America and because the war. I mean, I felt really close to this war. Um, the lesson from all this is some of you in the future may get a call from Max Rudin. <laughs> Here's my advice. You can surrender early or you can surrender late. But ladies and gentlemen, you will surrender. I can assure you of this. So now, to get into this book a little bit, this volume had, had a really huge fundamental challenge. And that is, uh, how do you begin to select from the hundreds and thousands of pieces, uh, articles, nonfiction pieces, uh, that you could extract or somehow include in this volume? This book, so far as I am concerned, would have been impossible without our advisors, uh, Jennifer Keene, Edward Langell, uh, Michael Nyberg, and Chad Williams. Uh, this book would have been equally impossible without Jeffrey O'Brien of the Library of America and Derek Schilling, uh, who is one of these incredibly picky, picky, <laughs> so picky. I mean, this, this is an author's dream. Uh, 
this is what you really want. Um, and especially when you're handling this kind of material, which is as rich as it gets. But the question now is how to winnow thousands of things down to some 125 pieces that will, that will tell the story. And this, is, um, this book is challenging in another way too, in that it is not just literature, but it is also history. So how can you keep the chronicle of the war going along and at the same time be selecting uh, some of the most illuminating and best writing that there was in the period? My role, I considered writing head notes and an introduction to all this, um, along with selecting with the aforementioned people, was really to be the kind of setting on a ring. Uh, and my job, I think, was really just to hold up these little gems that appear in the book. And each piece in this book is a standalone gem. So how to, how to really do service to all of that? The selections we began, I think, which is why Max Rudin began with me, is because the dominant voice of the age was Woodrow Wilson. And I knew Woodrow Wilson pretty well at this point having read about Woodrow Wilson all my life and having just spent 13 years writing his biography. So he was no stranger to me. And I knew because he was the dominant voice of the period, maybe of the century, that he was gonna be the tent poles of this story. Because this war started in 1914, ended in 1918, although it dribbled on for a little more, as you can see in the book. But during that period, Woodrow Wilson did everything he could to keep us out of the war. Then he recognized perhaps its inevitability and he began to draw us into it. And ultimately, he was a commander in chief and then he wanted to lead the peace process. That basically brought us to a new position in the world. And we became the first modern superpower in the world. All of this is World War I and Woodrow Wilson's speeches really take us along the way. There were great debates, great discussions going on in this country about this war. Do we belong in this war? What is the role of the United States in the world? These are all big questions that were being posed by Woodrow Wilson, uh, answered even before he could ask the questions by Teddy Roosevelt, uh, who loathed Woodrow Wilson. Anything Wilson was for, Teddy Roosevelt was against. Uh, and you'll see that debate going on. Teddy Roosevelt wanted us in the war almost from the very beginning. He liked his wars. Uh, then we had Woodrow Wilson's uh, Secretary of State, William Jennings Bryan, who was a pacifist, who said and did everything he could to keep us out of the war, uh, ultimately resigning from Woodrow Wilson's cabinet because he thought Wilson's speeches were getting a little too bellicose. So these voices are coming in. What about Eugene Debs, the great socialist? So we have political voices over here to play with. Then we have some of the greatest journalism ever written, I think. There's some fantastic war correspondence, the likes of John Reed, of Richard Harding Davis, of Nellie Bly, of Floyd Gibbons. If you don't know the name Floyd Gibbons, if you haven't read Floyd Gibbons, gosh, read Floyd Gibbons in this book. They, it's just sensational what this man did. I knew of him, I had never read him. Terrible confession, but there it is. Now, you know, a lot of great novelists, some of America's greatest novelists, emerged after World War I. But because this book is about nonfiction and celebrating that, Another challenge became how can we incorporate some of these undeniable, inevitable writers, but do it in a nonfiction volume? And the first way was, well, who were they before they were writing their fiction? So what about letters from Ernest Hemingway, who's over in Europe uh, doing basically ambulance work? How do we hear from him? How do we hear from John Dos Passos? Um, what diaries, what letters home were they writing? So we want to take in all that. And then as you heard, we had Edith Wharton. I mean, few of us recall, there was Edith Wharton, the grand dame of Manhattan, at the front lines of World War I, writing some of the most dazzling reportage 
ever. So this was exciting. Now, you know, writing is a lot more than this, too. What about some of the great songs of the day? Don't those lyrics tell us something about what's going on? How you're going to keep them down on the farm after they've seen Paris? What, what about George M. Cohen talking about over there, and we won't come back till it's over over there? What about poems of the day? What about Will Rogers, the first political satirist in this country, telling jokes about World War I? So we want to throw all that in there, too. And then there's the real meat of this book, I think, and that's the writing of the unfamous, the stirring stories told by nurses, again, who wrote letters home, who kept diaries, who wrote memoirs, Mary Borden, uh, Shirley Millard, Ellen Lamott. The, the eloquence of these women is just staggering sometimes. And then, of course, the soldiers themselves. Again, letters, diaries. What about letters from... What about having some letters from Captain Truman of Independence, Missouri, back to his sweetheart, Bess Wallace, whom, if I live through this thing, I will marry you? How about those letters? That's worth it, it seemed to me, too. Wars also are game changers, not just on the front, but you have to remember the home front, too. And this country changed significantly in almost every way. Um, from top to bottom during the war. It was such a huge upheaval. And I would say the two constituencies we tried to address the most in this book were perhaps the two greatest constituencies at the time who were writing a lot. They were women who got the vote because of World War I. Well, what was that debate about? What was that discussion about? What were those women activists writing about? And then there is the great African-American struggle uh, for equality that happened during World War I, um, or unfortunately didn't really happen. And 400,000 African-American soldiers went over there, coming home with their red badges of courage, uh, coming home, or many coming home as corpses, you know, w being met by mothers who lost sons just as white mothers had lost their sons, expecting basically to be fully accepted and franchised to become part of the American system. And they were not welcomed home. They were basically treated the same as before they went or even worse. And that led to what I believe is the beginning of the modern civil rights movement in this country, which was in the summer of 1919, which was a summer of bloody riots all over the country, known as the Red Summer. And all this, too, you see, comes out of World War I. So you see, in putting this together, we had just so much richness to deal with. And in putting it together, I began to think, in writing my introduction, you know, what have I learned from all of this? And I learned two or three things that I'll pass along to you, and then we can move on for the rest of the evening. But the first is this. The history aside, and you can read this book and just read it for the history, but there was so much great writing that occurred during World War I. It is one of the two or three greatest periods in this country. Edmund Wilson once commented about how, how he couldn't believe how much great writing came from even the simplest people during the Civil War, and that it could hardly ever be matched. I stack up our World War I alongside the Civil War, and again, from, in some cases, from uneducated, simple people. And it made me think that maybe Maybe the war was so horrifying, maybe all war is so horrifying, that with it comes great clarity uh, and great honesty. And you will find that again in every piece in this book. The second thing that began to occur to me was this theme of identity that popped up from the beginning of the war to the end. It seemed to me that the whole raison d'etre for this uh, war had to do with nations, sometimes small nations, being part of giant empires, uh, were just trying to assert their own identity, to find their own identity. We have instance of Henry James 
an American-born and educated author living in England, having to decide for himself during the war, is he an American or is he a Brit? And he wrestles with that in one of the pieces uh, that we have in the book. It also occurred to me that this country itself went through a great identity crisis in that period, emerging from an isolationist country with an army the size of Portugal's when this war started, and by the end of it, we are the greatest military superpower for the next century. We have Woodrow Wilson giving a speech uh, just 100 years ago last April, on April 2nd, 1917, in which he asked Congress for a declaration of war, and within that speech is a sentence that has become the bedrock of all American foreign policy for the last 100 years. Let me get that right. All American foreign policy for the last century comes from one sentence. You'll find it in your book. Uh, <laughs> the world must be made safe for democracy. And that has been wrongly or rightly the just, been the justification for almost every American incursion ever since. And you know, our entire economy changed because of World War I. Our foreign policy, as I've just tipped my hand, changed because of it. We came up with new things like a debt ceiling. War bonds happened in World War I. Do you know we got daylight savings time because of World War I? This came, again, from Woodrow Wilson. And I was reading just today, as most of you did as well, I'm sure, of the knife-wielding assailant uh, in Paris, carrying knives and a hammer. And his words were, this is for Syria. Now, yes, on one hand, it's about what's going on in Syria. But in fact, the French-Syrian connection goes directly back to World War I, when after the war, France had the mandate over Syria. So everything. So I think I will leave you with this, that whether you are interested in this war or not, you really should be, uh, whether you like this war or not, whether you believe in our entering this war or not, almost everything, not just in American society, but in the society of, of societies around the world, all go back to World War I. And I am most grateful to the NEH, and I am most grateful to the Library of America for allowing me to edit this book. Thank you very much. It's time for the sorbet course. Uh, we, we, um, before we get there, I uh, wanted to just recognize uh, one special person here tonight. Um, in addition to the support from the National Number of Humanities, the World War I volume was made possible by a generous gift from Library of America trustee Elihu Rose, uh, who's here tonight, I believe. <laughs> Elihu Rose, Elihu Rose made the gift uh, in memory of his father who served in that war. Tonight's World War I musical program was produced by Lawrence Maslon, a great and longtime friend of Library of America and editor of our two-volume collection, American Musicals. Uh, please note one program change. Uh, joining singer Malcolm Getz tonight to our great good fortune is Kirsten Anderson, fresh from her starring role as Maria von Trapp in the successful two-year national tour of The Sound of Music. You will shortly be overheard bragging you knew her when. Please welcome Kirsten Anderson and Malcolm Getz. He wrote the scores to several jewel-like intimate musicals 
a song that seemed to sum up the comfortable composure of a country an ocean away from the turmoil of the Great War. The story goes that on April 6, 1917, the Broadway titan George M. Cohan was at his Long Island home with the morning's newspaper. Well, when he read that America had declared war with Germany, he summoned his driver to bring him into town. By the time he arrived in Manhattan, Cohan had finished the anthem of the American home front. Johnny, get your gun, get your gun, get your gun. Take it on the run, on the run, on the run. Hear them calling you and me, every son of liberty. Hurry right away, no delay, go today. Make your daddy glad to have had such a lad. Tell your sweetheart not to pine, to be proud. Just a while, and I would like to state the 
life is simply wonderful, the army food is great. I sleep with 97 others in a wooden hut. I love them all, they all love me. It's very lovely, but... Oh, how I hate to get up in the morning. Oh, how I'd love to remain in bed. For the hardest blow of all is to hear the bugler call. You gotta get up, you gotta get up, you gotta get up this morning. Someday I'm going to murder the bugler. Someday they're going to find him dead. I'll amputate his reveille and step upon it heavily and spend the rest of my life in bed. Berlin performed this song in the 1918 Broadway review, Yip Yip Yapping. And years later, during World War II, Berlin returned to the song in a new Broadway show called This is the Army. In 1943, he filmed the number for a Warner Brothers picture with the same title, starring a contract player named Ronald Reagan. While the cameras were rolling during Berlin's solo, a grizzled stagehand remarked, geez, if the guy who wrote this song could hear how this guy's murdering it, he'd be rolling in his grave. Sing along with us, will you? A nation that sings can never be beaten, wrote the Saturday Evening Post in 1918. Songs are to a nation's spirit what ammunition is to a nation's army.
every single day, all the papers say, Mary's bow is oh so brave, with his little gun, chasing every hun, he has taught them to behave, little Mary proudly shakes her head, and says, After the armistice, America's songwriters embraced a more nuanced, more complex sensibility. Broadway would explode in the 1920s, and songwriters such as the Gershwins, Rogers and Hart, Cole Porter, they would make their own names on the Great White Way. But it was up to Jerome Kern once again to capture the optimism of a nation that had survived a global catastrophe. The clouds of war had blown away, and the horizon was bright and shining. I'll be following your plan Till I see the brightness in every morning pan I am sure your point of view will ease the daily groove So I'll keep repeating in my mind Look for the silver lining when If only I had put my remarks to music, <laughs> I think I'd be better off. Um, thank you, Kristen and, and Malcolm, uh, for your wonderful performance, and a special thanks to Scott also um, for your remarks, for your superb editing of our World War I anthology, and most especially for your longtime dedication to the Library of America as a director and now as a newly elected life trustee. I am Betsy Smith, I am the chair of the board of the Library of America, and I would like to thank everyone in this room for helping LOA reach this milestone of our 35th anniversary. 
This year, as you heard from Max, we will release our 300th volume in our series, which is now recognized as the gold standard of American publishing and the national edition of American writing. There are over 10 million of our books in homes and schools and colleges and libraries, large and small, around the world. And it is for this astonishing accomplishment that we gathered all of you here this evening to offer our thanks. The library is exceptionally fortunate to have a distinguished and deeply committed board of directors, 18 individuals from the worlds of business and academia and the arts who lend their time and talent and support to this unique institution. Equally dedicated are the co-chairs of the Fellows of the Library of America, which is our patrons group, and all of their names are listed on the back of the program. But they are not alone in their commitment and support of LOA, since all of you have been instrumental in helping to sustain this institution for 35 years. In my view, at this moment, uh, the Library of America's mission to keep America's great writing alive in our culture has never been more important. Reading these writers deepens our understanding of the world, especially vital in turbulent times like these, and deepens our appreciation of the American experience. Reaching into this expertly curated bookshelf of American writing ignites a pride in our culture and appreciation for brilliant writing. Tonight we celebrate many accomplishments, but while our reputation is sky high, our ambitions are higher. This is a pivotal moment for the Library of America. We must do more than publish exemplary editions, which will continue to be the cornerstone of our mission. We must also develop new and exciting ways to share this writing with more people everywhere. Outreach programs and digital initiatives to keep pace with how today's readers connect with books and with each other. And this is a very important part of our cultural mission because when we share these timeless works by our greatest writers, we're giving people access to history and to ideas that are empowering and enriching. To do this, we will need your help. For Library of America to grow and to serve readers in new ways, our resources must grow as well. Tonight, you'll be glad to know, is a night of thanks, not of solicitation. But I wanted to announce that the board and I have embarked on the Library of America's first major capital campaign to raise an initial goal of $12 million to sustain the organization for the long term and to provide the resources to increase the organization's impact and visibility. The campaign is still in its quiet phase while we turn to our most dedicated supporters to make a gift to the endowment or to adopt a volume and become its guardian. We hope we can count on you to help us reach this ambitious goal. Tonight's program uh, underscores the ways in which the Library of America is essential as a cultural institution, and there is no one better to articulate the value of what the Library of America has done, and with your help will continue to do, than Adam Gopnik. In addition to being on the board of, of LOA, and we are thrilled to have him, Adam has been a staff writer at The New Yorker since 1986, where he writes memorably and frequently on a wide range of topics, books, intellectual history, art, politics, and also finds time to lecture widely on literature, music, and art. He has written a half a dozen books for adults, several for children, all of which have earned him acclaim, awards, and prizes. Adam is particularly eloquent on the value of the humanities in general, and the value of the Library of America in particular. So please welcome Adam Gopnik. Thank you. Thank you, Betsy, and thank you all. Please don't think I'm sending out an order to Seamless. I have the habit of putting my notes on my phone these days. By the way, did I miss a beat? Who wrote the lyric for if he can love like he can fight, or if he can fight like he can love? I missed that. It was, is that right? Yeah, it's a fantastic lyric. It, 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 it truly is. 
Um, when I was um, when asked to say a few words uh, this evening, I was thinking about how I could connect uh, this wonderful anthology about World War I with the broader subject of the first 35 years of LOA, um, how those two things seemed to come together. And it occurred to me, after some thought, that there was a single and striking way in which they did come together. And that was around the figure of that other great American Wilson, not Woodrow, who Scott has told us and instructed us so much about, but Edmund. Edmund Wilson, my great predecessor at The New Yorker, and one of the foundational figures, if not indeed the foundational figure, in the making of the Library of America. As many of you know, it was Wilson who had the insistent notion that America deserved a pleiad of its own. He had in mind the great French series, which continues to this day, in which standard editions of all of the classic writers are available in relatively inexpensive, standardized, and reliable form. It seemed to him scandalous that no such equivalent existed for the United States, and he made it his special mission to bring about an American pleiad, and Library of America is and has succeeded in being exactly that and more than that. I'll say more about that in a moment. But one of the crucial things when we think about Edmund Wilson and his evolution and the arc of his career is that it exactly pivots on the experience of the First World War. Because Wilson saw that the First World War, the Great War, as it was known, had altered culture in an absolutely vital, uh, permanent, and in many respects, catastrophic way. That the modernist art and literature that he so keenly admired and in many respects was the first critic to bring to the United States depended on the rupture in civilization that had been created by the Great War. Many responses poured out, the anarchic responses of, da of data, the heartbroken responses of Siegfried Sassoon or Robert Graves in England. But Wilson recognized that that had been where the first and primal painful energies of the thing we call modernity had begun. And Wilson recognized something else that was peculiar to us in America, and that was that we as Americans, and as Scott Berg's anthology makes so plain, we had, as the songs we just listened to moments ago make plain, we had a double experience of that, of that moment and of that war, where it was an unmitigated catastrophe for France and England and Germany. For us, it had a double meaning. On the one hand, a place where far too many were killed and, and brought home dead, but it was also a moment of cultural emancipation. It was a moment of American pain, but it was also the crucial moment of American arrival when for the first time, Americans felt themselves capable in literature above all to, of rivaling and outdoing their European counterparts and predecessors. It was exactly the moment when Ernest Hemingway felt that he was ready to go eight rounds with Mr. Maupassant and beat him. <laughs> that's the background, that's the background of Wilson's dream of a library of America, of a pleiad. It was exactly through that moment of American arrival that Wilson and the generation that included Van Wyck Brooks, for instance, realized that not only would you have to understand and sponsor and promote the writing of the new generation of Hemingway and Dos Passos and Wilson's dear friend Fitzgerald in America and a broader range of writers who included, for Wilson as a sometimes forgotten, Don Powell and Anita Luce and uh, Dorothy Parker, uh, but one would also have to rethink the American past and what we took from it. And if you read through Wilson's uh, remarkable writing from the New Yorker in the 1940s, half of it is devoted to explaining to people who Nabokov and Kafka are, and the other half is devoted to explaining to Americans why Edgar Allan Poe is a great and major writer, not simply a maker of scary stories, why Melville is a towering figure in world literature, not simply the guy who wrote the book about the whale. Um, as Harold Ross famously wrote on the galley of that piece of Wilson's, is Moby Dick the man or the fish? Um, <laughs> Wilson explained why it was the man who wrote the book about the man and the fish. 
in all of those ways, the I, Wilson's idea of a Library of America was simultaneously a present tense idea and a past tense idea. And in all of those ways, that's the thing that those of us who love and cherish this institution and organization continue to pursue. There does seem to be one significant difference between the idea of Library of America, of an American Pleiad as it was first put forward by Wilson and his contemporaries, and the form that it has taken and the ideals that it has realized in those 35 years. For the one thing that I don't think anyone could have adequately anticipated in the early 1980s was the extraordinarily broad range and spectrum of literature that would be included in that American Pleiad. This is not simply a constellation of American stars. This is the entire American cosmos represented on paper. The Library of America has, with extraordinary boldness and conviction, and I ask you all to salute Max and Jeffrey and Cheryl and the rest of the extraordinary team who did that. The Library of America's Evolve not only has brought us standard editions of Melville and Twain and Howells, uh, anthologies of Americans in Paris of the experience of the First World War, they've also brought uh, unequivocally and boldly and courageously into the mainstream of the American canon detective fiction, uh, science fiction, uh, horror stories, the full range of American expression, musical, uh, my favorite form, in fact, the musical lyrics and musical theater, and have recognized that these things are every bit as much a part of the articulation of American culture as the great masters of American literature are. That was a decision that took great boldness and it took great conviction. It's a decision that I think Edmund Wilson would have applauded because the Wilson is sometimes wrongly represented as a grand and stuffy pigeon. In fact, if you read his work, no one vibrated more readily to the highest moments in American popular culture than Wilson. One of the first to write about James N. M. Cain, one of the first to see Hollywood as a great subject in the hands of, of a Fitzgerald or an Anita Luce, one of the people who understood that the prime roots of American culture, as he wrote memorably in a review of Gene Fowler's book about John Barrymore, had always to resonate with Broadway and Hollywood in the American street. In all of those ways, I think we're blessed to have a Library of America that has taken on that larger task and has seen its role not simply to enshrine and preserve, but to enlarge and protect. I said not long ago that it seemed to me that Library of America had stumbled on a nearly perfect name in its evolution. Because in those three words, it seems to sum up everything that we value and that we think about when we think about American culture and American civilization. First, the idea of a library. We take libraries entirely for granted, but when we think about the role of the library, of the free library, as my native library in Philadelphia is called, in making American culture, it still astounds us. You only have had to live in France, as I was privileged to do for many years, to know the difference between getting your library card for the great French National Library and getting your library card for the New York Public Library to understand something of the difference between a democratic culture and a culture that still remains heavily hierarchical. It is harder to get a reading card for the Bibliothèque Nationale than it is to get an American passport, and it is easier <laughs> to get a ticket to go into the great reading room of the New York Public Library than it is to get a metro card. Uh, that's an astounding accomplishment, an astounding difference. And when we think about the lives of the founders of America, we realize again how significant the library is to their making. Um, Alexander Hamilton, whose double presence, both in a volume uh, here at Library of America and as the newly minted star and of Broadway, the one man my 17-year-old daughter most admires <laughs> and wants to imitate. Hamilton and his Confederates depended on inventing a library of their own, the library that now still persists as New York Society Library, in order to give foundation 
to their own change. They recognized that a library still controlled by king and church was inadequate to their own ambitions. Libraries in America are hugely important. And then I have a special affection for the word of, because it seems to me, it seems to me the most misaccented word in the history of American rhetoric. And I'm thinking, of course, about the greatest single piece of American rhetoric, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, which is almost always accented at the end, government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Where, of course, the sense of it is, is that government of the people, by the people, and for the people, shall not perish from the earth. The of is the thing we take for granted. There will always be government of the people. The question is, will it be by and for the people? The three should never be equally stressed. We take government for granted. Democracy is the accomplishment. Popular government is the accomplishment of immense fragility. And finally, there is the word America. Now, my dirty secret is that I am actually Canadian. Um, and as Canadians, of course, US citizen now for many a year, as Canadians, of course, we take the word America with a certain degree of scandalous offense. America is shared by many, and all Canadians, as you know, never refer to the place we are as America. We refer to it merely as the states. You're going down to the states, are you? You come from the states. You live in the states, because we all live in America. But the idea of America, undefined, unlimited by specific geographic constraints, remains an enormously rich one. Exactly because, as the Library of America has revealed to us for the past 35 years, it is an idea that is forever in contest, forever expanding, forever evolving, forever changing. The idea of America that Edmund Wilson began with in the 1920s when he wrote his masterpieces, Axel's Castle, later when he wrote The Wound in the Bow, is very different from the idea of America that we stand and share today. That's not a story of mindless relativism. That's a story of the constant acquisition of a broader and more capacious sensibility. Scott Berg said with such truth that the fundamental question of the Great War, the First World War, was the question of identity. And I would add that it was a tragedy, a catastrophe of identity in many ways, when the great cosmopolitan civilization of Europe in 1914, what was then called the Concert of Europe, fragmented on the rocks exactly of the insistence on narrow assertion of national identity in favor of the constant search for a broader shared cosmopolitan union. We live at a time when that sense of cosmopolitanism has perhaps never been as threatened as it is today in our own country when the wrong idea of identity, identity not rising from the, from the reality we share, not articulated as part always of double identity, of positive shared identity, of the polyglot and plural identity that we all seek for, but narrowly in terms of simple, monolithic and vengeful identity, never in American history has the specifically American idea of identity been so jeopardized and so threatened as it is today. And so, it seems to me that never before have we needed those three words in their neat and potent collision. Libraries to open our minds, ofs to remind us that we have to choose how to be governed, and a broadly capacious idea of America that takes in the broadest possible number and plurality of identities that the world brings to it. I ask you to celebrate with me 35 years of something that means more than three words, the Library of America. Thank you. Wow. Warmest thanks to Scott Berg and Adam Gopnik for their really inspiring remarks. 
With writers of their caliber on our side, the future for the Library of America is bright indeed. This evening reminds us of the brilliant literary legacy we all share and gives us the chance to thank all of you for your splendid support over 35 years and 300 volumes. When we started this literary rescue operation, we called it The Project, and we had no idea if it would be a success. Would anyone want these books? Would we choose the right works to publish? And how would we keep the enterprise, how would we sustain the enterprise financially? But readers and reviewers welcomed the books and applauded the notion of caring for and celebrating our literary heritage. So what had started out as the project is now a cultural institution, an essential cultural institution, and a National Library of American Writing, as I think every speaker before me said tonight, whose mission is to make more readers aware of this precious legacy and to keep American writing alive in the culture. Over the years, we've been so very fortunate with the help we've had from so many people. So we thank tonight, first and foremost, our founders and trustees for their vision, their perseverance, their dedication, and for guiding the organization so ably. We thank the foundations that provided the seed funding to create the Library of America, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Ford Foundation. Because they did a brave thing, the proposition wasn't all that simple. It wasn't a matter of restoring a physical artifact. What was necessary was to reanimate, to reinvigorate the sense of what constitutes our literary heritage. We owe thanks to the literary scholars the historians and the writers who have helped to shape the series and prepare the volumes for publication. We owe thanks to the designers and printers who have made the books beautiful, lasting objects. The critic Clive James compared the books to small, irresistible children that beg to be picked up. <laughs> thanks to the agents and publishers who have worked with us and who have made it possible for us to include in our editions the works by writers they represent. Thanks to our distributors and suppliers for showcasing the books and promoting them among the public. To the journalists and reviewers who have reviewed our books from the very beginning and frequently and abundantly and, and enthusiastically since 1982 and continuing till now with the, our most recent title, a collection of American writing about rock and pop called Shake It Up. <laughs> and since the Library of America's commitment to a writer begins but does not end with publication, we thank all of our guardians, many of whom are here this evening, for adopting books and keeping them permanently in print through our Guardians of American Letters Fund. About half of our 300 volumes have been adopted by guardians and so are continuously available to readers now and readers in the future. That leaves well over 100 volumes waiting for adoption. <laughs> Perhaps some of you will be inspired this evening to become a guardian and give an orphan a home. Thanks to all of our fellows, our members, our subscribers, and our donors whose support has made it possible for us to maintain the, edit the high editorial and production standards you have come to expect, to create public programming and digital resources, and to provide gift sets to schools, libraries, and prisons here and around the world so that American writing is truly accessible. And finally, to readers everywhere, readers like you who have bought the books for yourselves and for friends, and who have collected them over the years. To all of you, in whatever role you have played, our sincere thanks and appreciation for helping the Library of America to get this far. But I won't lie to you, keeping this literary ship afloat is a great and growing challenge. It requires imagination and it requires resources, which is why we hope you will continue to support this enterprise. 
and to tell your friends about the Library of America. It's amazing how many people still think we're the Library of Congress. <laughs> With your encouragement and support, we hope to sail on for another 35 years and beyond. Please thank again our performers, our music director, and our, especially our speakers for making this such a memorable and festive occasion. And thanks to all of you. Thank you.